Morning, everyone, and welcome to this bright and early Tortoise Breakfast Thinking. I'm Alexi Mostras. I'm an editor and partner at Tortoise. I hope everyone's got a coffee or two and are ready for a great hour of uh, discussion. Um, today's thinking asks the question, is a, more, uh, is a more automated job market less fair? And in, in many ways, it's a strange question because for years uh, before technology uh, came on the scene, recruitment was plagued by a host of biases. You only have to look at some of the figures on diversity in the workplace to realize uh, the seriousness uh, of the injustice. Only half of FTSE 100 companies have directors from BAME backgrounds. 95% of receptionists and legal secretaries and care assistants are female in the UK. 85% of investment bankers are male men continue to be far more likely than women to be in leadership roles across all sectors. And much of the bias that has led to this uh, has uh, uh, been unconscious. Uh, humans are swayed by whether the candidate went to the interview of school uh, or uh, have a name that they can easily pronounce. When I was researching this, uh, I came across a survey um, of 20% uh, that, that found that 20% of female BAME job seekers altered their names in applications and the one that, ones that did got a much higher level of callback. 51% of HR professionals uh, were found to be biased against overweight women and uh, were unaware that that's the case. So there's obviously a, a problem here and there's a strong argument that AI can remove some of these biases by, by removing these, these human errors. And it's a technology that certainly uh, promises to do that. But is it actually leading us into an even more and potentially even more invidious situation where past inbuilt biases are kind of baked in to future recruitment on an ever increasing scale using data points that few of us know or understand? So this thinking is normally about uh, recruitment tech, but actually it's, it's far more interesting than that. Uh, it's about fairness. Uh, and it's about the role of technology in establishing and maintaining that principle. So to discuss all this, we have three uh, brilliant guests uh, today. Patrick Brion, Head of Policy and Research at the IPA. Uh, Jazz Broton, a consultant at Hustle Crew. And Michelle Hanchich, a Global Head of Consulting Psychology uh, at talent management platform Pymetrics and a, cons and a, and a psychologist herself. Um, so just before we get started, I should explain a little bit about what a thinking is uh, or uh, what it's not, uh, which is a panel discussion. Uh, much as our guests are all uh, amazing, uh, we want to hear primarily from you. Um, and the hope is that by the, the end of the process, we'll come to a, a more clear understanding of a complex topic by hearing your own experiences. So the one loosely enforced rule is uh, no questions. Uh, please uh, come into the conversation, tell us about your experiences in recruitment, your experiences with, with AI. That is really crucial to the process uh, this morning. You can do that in two ways. Uh, you can either uh, raise your blue hand in, um, the uh, on the participants bar of the of the, of the zoom uh, menu or you can jump into the chat uh, and uh, my colleague uh, Ella Hill is moderating the chat so so say what you want to say there and and she'll pull out a couple of comments and privately message me um, and I will come uh, come to you so please do get involved last thing to say is that this thing has been recorded so we can splice it together and put it out on social media uh, but don't don't let that put you off uh, being indiscreet. So um, let's start, please. Patrick, can we turn to you? I, can you just lay out the landscape of how businesses recruit employees 10 years ago and how technology has changed the entire landscape from, from A to Z? Sure. So, I mean, going back sort of 10, 15 years, um, as you mentioned earlier, most uh, recruitment was done uh, primarily in person through, you know, human uh, recruitment managers. And there was relatively little use of, of what we'd call AI or um, algorithms in the recruitment process. And now uh, things have shifted so that not only are we using the kind of CV screening tools that you mentioned in your introduction there, but really uh, algorithms and artificial intelligence have permeated almost every stage uh, of recruitment. So um, in the posting of job adverts and targeting uh, of job ads, 
uh, through social media or other digital platforms, even in the design and wording of those job ads themselves. Um, it's obviously used as a CV screen. In fact, it's estimated that the majority of CVs uh, now submitted by job applicants never even see human eyes and are actually filtered out um, by these algorithmic screening tools before they even get to a human recruiter. Uh, we then see the use of a technology in uh, a lot of psychometric testing or other uh, tests or games that are being introduced at a kind of uh, pre-interview stage of the recruitment process. Um, and then some firms have actually gone a step beyond that and are actually introducing uh, elements of artificial intelligence into the interviews themselves. Um, so having people record their, uh, their job interview um, and the questions be asked by artificial intelligence or chatbot um, and then have even in the most extreme cases, the use of technology to actually scan people's uh, facial expressions during interviews. Uh, and, and make some kind of purported assessment on the candidate quality based on things like that, which is really uh, slightly more dubious, but what they, I suppose, would describe as cutting edge end of the uh, of the spectrum. And then alongside all of that, you also have the use of things like uh, chatbots to support candidates throughout the recruitment process from beginning to end, um, to keep them informed as to the next stage, make sure they don't drop out. Um, so really, really end-to-end -end use of um, technology, uh, artificial intelligence, and, and AI. Th thank you. J Jazz, same question to you. In, in your own work, how has technology changed uh, what you do and, and how you see the recruitment landscape? Yeah, so I think um, as somebody who, uh, Hustle Crew, we everything we do is around creating a more diverse and inclusive tech landscape. So we are techies um, through and through, but we are very much um, aware that the inclusion of technology in some senses can work really well in making it more a more diverse process, making it easier to find those candidates that are allegedly harder to find. Um, but we also know that, you know, the statistics that you mentioned before, names, you know, it's, it's machine learning, which is essentially scanning large amounts of data. And if that data has the bias baked in already, then the system is flawed from day zero. So a lot of it is around um, bringing in the technology um, around the recruitment stage. And that's a lot of a lot of the work that we do at the very beginning um, and ensuring that the humans in control of it are making those biases that are perhaps unconscious conscious so that they can critique the software um, and be in control of it. How do you, give, give me an example of how you turn unconscious bias into conscious bias in, in practice and, and how you make sure that feeds into algorithms that are used to recruit. Yeah, it's having conversations. Um, everything that we do in terms of Hustle Crew, yes, we release a lot of content, but we do workshops intimate workshops with teams. Uh, we're quite particular about the companies that we work with. There has to be a level of commitment and everybody has to be in the room. Um, even just this week, you know, I, I'm based in the UK and the government made, uh, have had bias training, but it's been optional. So then that's a loophole because the busy engineers don't have to come or the, the busy sales team don't have to come. So then it becomes optional to have a conversation about these biases and become aware. Because I think we, we know the ones that we spoke about in school. We know about the ones that work against women. But do we know about affinity bias, which is something that you touched on before, which means that this person's like me. So I'm more likely to, to want them. And, and, and I think in recruitment in general, um, there's been a huge moment around this whole hiring for culture fit and exposing that as another way of saying people that are like me and understanding the barriers that that poses to um, diverse and inclusive, you know, having a diverse and inclusive recruitment process really. Um, so having conversations around that, because we don't, we have conversations about everything. We have sex education. Nobody talks to us about identity. Nobody talks to us about, the person sitting next to you's identity until you know you say something awkward as an innocent child um but other than that we kind of go through life especially if you're british not talking about it it goes into the bucket we're talking about money and politics uh, we don't discuss race 
so then we don't know how to deal with it or we don't discuss sexuality because we go oh that's their business you know that's so interesting um, I, I i really want to come um to michelle but jazz can i just stick on you for a, a second because what you said is so fascinating so it if you get a group of white male engineers all in their 20s which uh is not atypical can you change their the risk of them injecting bias into software through conversations or ultimately do you need to actually change the makeup of the engineers themselves i i don't think we need to change the makeup of the of of the engineers in the moment because i know i'm talking to people who the team you have is the team you have by no means am i suggesting that everybody fire half of their white male population and hire in diverse people so we have to have a bit of both. Yes, having diverse candidates in the room is, is very important, but only if they're able to be themselves. Again, it then goes back to that conversation. Do I work in an environment where I can code review my colleague and as part of that code review question, maybe we have some bias here. And that's where the conversation becomes powerful because once you have the conversation, you have a shared understanding that then becomes the baseline in the same way that we're not sexist at work and we don't bully people at work and we're not mean it then becomes part of that it's, it becomes something that it's valid to give feedback on it's valid for us to look at in a competency framework of anything that we are executing does it break the platform does it do, you know the typical questions that qa would look at or um, engineers would look at then adding that to okay this is something that is dealing with humans in the same way that we'll test something with customers are we making sure that this is the best fit for the candidates and for the objective that we we have but you can't in that moment fostering inclusion is difficult if you don't have the baseline you end up then having these individual soldiers um who are always willing seemingly to call someone out and then it becomes a hostile environment so i i think it is a bit of both i do believe that individuals can change and cultures can change but it has to be it has to be deliberate it has to be something that is baked in to this culture um ab about you know being anti-racist being a place that wants to be diverse and inclusive and and i say this as somebody who has worked with companies who have said look we are pretty much all white but we want to have this conversation because we want to understand how not only we can hire diverse individuals, but we can help them be themselves in all different shapes, sizes and forms. Thank you. Uh, Michelle, I, I was reading uh, some of the claims made by uh, AI uh, recruitment platforms the other day, and, and some of them are kind of scary. You, you've got this company called Entello that says, we don't just find skilled people. We predict whether they're considering new pastures by looking on at what they're saying and doing on social media, including whether they've changed their profiles. You know, you have higher view using video interviews with inbuilt emotion recognition tech. Um, Tripad uses algorithms capable of finding patterns in the career histories of people to predict future job advancement. It, it, it's, it's all a little bit minority report. So I wonder whether you could give us the case for what AI and recruitment can, can do and why we shouldn't be scared of it. Yeah. Look, I think, you know, those sorts of examples, Alexi, are really important to showcase that the landscape of AI in recruitment and selection right now is exceptionally broad. So, you know, you do have technology that is, you know, scraping data from CVs. Um, which, you know, I can talk a lot about a lot about that as a, as a concept. Um, then, as you say, you've got, you know, technology that's scraping information from, you know, social media posts and platforms. And I think one of the first premises that we need to think about is just because we can do it doesn't mean we should, right? And so we might find, for example, that through an algorithm that we can actually predict something um, based on someone's social media profile, right? Um, does that actually make it meaningful though, right? Just because you can make a prediction doesn't mean that actually this will have an eventual impact on someone's performance on the job. It's a little bit like saying there's a strong correlation between shark attacks and ice cream sales. Well, it doesn't mean that ice cream sales causes shark attacks. It's the hot weather and everyone's in the beach, right? <laughs> and the sharks are swimming around. So there's a lot more at, at play here. And so I think, um, 
the the opportunities for AI, yes, absolutely go in with your eyes open around the type of data that is actually being used. Um, and, you know, when we think about, for example, the approach that we take at, at Pymetrics is around, let's actually remove the CV from the process altogether. Because we know, for example, there are lots of technologies out there that are scraping CVs, but we also know that the way females record and document their experience is actually quite different to the way males will do that. And we've seen attempts at, you know, de-identifying CVs as an attempt to address bias in the recruitment process because people are either changing their names or leaving their original names and being discriminated against. Um, and so our approach is actually let's remove the CV because A, we know it's actually not predictive of job success and B, let's use some more valid data that is actually meaningful and, and predictive of, of eventual job success. Um, so I think, you know, certainly starting from the perspective of data that is meaningful and predictive of something important that you can then action and do something with um, is where we really need to need to start. Um, and, you know, in the work of there, I mean, there are a number of researchers um, Joy Bulamwini is one who's done a lot of work around looking at, you know, the facial recognition software space and the um, inability for that technology to accurately identify dark skinned females, right? White males tick very successful in identifying those images accurately, but anyone who deviates from that, the algorithms start to struggle. And so, you know, we do absolutely need to be very, very vigilant around the promises of these technologies um, and really go under the hood, right, would be my, uh, my suggestion. I've, I've got two, two quick, I want to bring in a couple of people who have um, um, said really interesting things in the, in the chat. Uh, Tom Nakin uh, is talking about uh, how he, he has interacted with assessment tech as a, as a dyslexic person. So I, I'm very interested to hear from him. But Michelle, I have two quick follow-up questions for you. Firstly, just can you describe how you, your company uses AI to assess um, potential uh, uh, performance. If you do take away the CV, then actually yeah. what, what happens in practice what? would be my first question. Yeah. And, and secondly, on the facial recognition point, I'm interested. So obviously there's a discriminatory problem because uh, there's kind of inbuilt biases within the technology that discriminate against or in favor of white people in that case. But if they didn't discriminate, would you be in favor of using facial recognition as a means of assessing performance? Okay, two good questions. So the first in terms of what we do at Pymetrics, uh, essentially what we do is we work with clients around collecting what we call behavioral data. So we use a gamified assessment platform and we capture behavior in, in real time um, from individuals. And so we then we will deploy the assessment right at the front of the selection funnel. And as soon as a candidate applies, they will complete the Pymetrics exercises, we'll capture their behavioral data. Um, and then what we'll do is we'll compare that to success models that have either been built custom for the organization or have been built off a particular job. And so so what we do in that instance is we have a very much a data-driven and objective way to look at this is how an individual has performed, this is what people who are successful in the role alike have performed, and let's compare the two and let's see how much of a match they are based on the behaviours that we know are critical to job success. So that's essentially how we do it, which is why we don't need necessarily a CV um, and we can also bring, you know, bring skills, um, self-reported skills data in on that journey as well. Um, in terms of from a, a facial recognition perspective, I think the, the key question for me is, okay, let's say it was, it was fair, is if we think about micro expressions in the face, which is essentially what this technology is actually assessing, how meaningful is that actually? So the fact that I, you know, twitched in a certain way or smiled in a certain way, why is that actually important to prediction on the job? And and also from, I guess, a fairness and equity perspective, if, you know, my facial features have been compared to a particular algorithm, I can't really do anything about that, right? Mm -hmm. So I can't actually develop that. And so what does that mean for the organisation or for the, sorry, for the individual who says, well, what, what's the feedback for me? And so for us, feedback is a huge 
um, focus in terms of empowering and helping everyone to find their place in the world of work. So that would be my, I guess, still reservation around the facial recognition piece. That's, re that's really interesting. Let's bring in Tom, if he's there. Um, Tom Lacken or Lakin? Yeah, hi there. Hey, how, how are you? Yeah, really well, thanks. Yeah, great, great talk. Thanks, thanks for making a, an interesting, just make the, same, make the point again to camera, if you don't mind. So, yeah, so really just kind of, um, I suppose going on to, to, to Michelle's discussion around um, gamified assessment, um, I'm actually a big fan of it personally. I know in, there's some, in, some comments around it being uh, questionable use of technology, and I, I do kind of understand that as, as well. Um, but so the principles of gamified assessment, so essentially applying game-based principles to assessment um, is interesting, um, particularly when you have thousands of CVs. Um, I'm from a recruitment background, so I feel the pain of literally having to go through thousands of CVs. But I wanted to flag that I also, as, I've also gone through it as a candidate. I, I, I do have a vested interest in this. It's my job to research this. But um, I, I, for a client, we deployed a similar tool to Pymetrics, not Timetrics, but, but similar in some principles, some ways. And um, the results were phenomenal. So they kind of back up a lot of the, the, the kind of arguments for it. But as an individual, I, I scored 3%. And so not only did I not, would I, if I was actually genuinely applying for the job, I wouldn't have not obviously got through the process, but I probably would have been, I can only imagine one of the weakest performers. <clears throat> and I, I believe that's because I'm dyslexic. My brain just simply does not work in some of these gamified ways that um, it didn't, I just struggled. So the prince of the strengths that I believe that I have, so I think that I'm empathetic. I think I'm curious. I'm a good critical thinker. Those are the strengths that I think I have, but pattern recognition, I'm clearly utterly, utterly dreadful at. And so I think that these kind of challenges need need flag, need flagging because I don't think I'm alone here. That's so, I, let me let me throw that back to Michelle. So he, here you have obviously, you know, a, an intelligent guy who's scoring three percent on a gamified test, which doesn't seem to. Uh, pick up on qualities like empathy and curiosity? Well, what do you say to him? Sure, sure. So I think there are a few things. I think one is um, an assessment provider worth its weight should try and provide modifications um, up front. So we certainly have a series of modifications that individuals can select from ADHD, dyslexia um, and colour blindness and the system, the, the games will adjust accordingly to accommodate for that. Um, but also there needs to be an, an alternative <laughs> Or every candidate who faces into, you know, um, I guess, or requires accommodations to be made, right? And the ability for the individual to reach out to the organisation to be able to, to flag that and be supported accordingly um, through that process. So definitely encourage every organisation. It should not be a blanket process for everyone. This is about inclusion and about supporting people who have, you know, diverse needs and, and accommodations that might be required. Um, the other thing, we, uh, we do work here in, in this region, I'm in Australia, so um, in, this, in this part of the world we're doing some work with an organisation supporting people on the autism spectrum and we've built success models specifically for that organisation to hire people who are on the spectrum and it's one of a number of assessments that they utilise, um, but we've seen really, really positive outcomes as a, as a result of, of that. Um, the candidates have really responded very well, you know, to that process as well. So I think you know, with thoughtfulness, we can actually support, you know, really everyone. Um, in a second, I'm going to turn to my colleague, um, Ella Hill, who's going to present five slides uh, to you all that really kind of summarise the, the, the key factors, the, the key issues in this whole debate. I, I found it very useful to kind of get my head around the, the parameters of, the, of this discussion. And then we're going to come, if I can, to, to Catherine Simmons, uh, who's made a a, a very interesting comment in in the chat, but but first, Patrick, just responding um, to to Tom's point, is there is there evidence that these um, these AI systems don't take into account people in his position uh, or in the position if you have ADHD or if you have another kind of um, um, uh, if, you, if, you, if you're suffering from a condition like that, what is the danger of that sort of discrimination being baked in? 
Yeah, well, I think that's a really important point. And, and there certainly is a lot of evidence um, that a lot of the algorithms actually in use in practice can be discriminatory specifically uh, against uh, neurodiverse people or people that might have mental health problems. Um, and that's not, not to say that there's something inherent about using an algorithm that, that means that you're going to discriminate against those people, just that in practice, the way that they're being used uh, often is discriminatory, particularly against those kinds of people. And you see that, I mean, th that can be the case uh, certainly sometimes with psychometric testing, uh, particularly it can be the, the case with the kind of higher view type uh, facial recognition uh, scanning during interviews that we talked about a little earlier, that can obviously be potentially um, quite discriminatory against autistic people um, who might not respond with the same kind of facial expressions as more neurotypical people. Um, there are also examples of uh, the use of uh, psychometric testing that's become particularly popular in certain parts. That can be itself discriminatory against people who might, for example, suffer from bipolar disorder, um, who will score very highly on neuroticism measures on if you're using a factor five personality test. Um, and there are examples uh, in the literature of people suffering from bipolar disorder um, who are rejected time and time again from, from jobs that are using these factor five personality uh, psychometric tests as a screen. Um, so th there's all kinds of um, different ways that the algorithms can discriminate against those people. And really, I think what it comes down to is a, a mistaken assumption that, that if you're using an algorithm, somehow what you're doing is inherently going to be more objective um, than if you're assessing people in person. I think that's quite a dangerous assumption to make, that the algorithm is measuring something, something objective, something something more real, more mathematical somehow than the subjective assessments that you know, we as humans might make about each other. Um, in fact, the algorithms are, are going to be using just as subjective measures. And that's not to say that they're, they're not going to be add something useful, that they shouldn't be used, but that we just need to take a little step back um, and recognize that actually there is no such thing as a perfectly objective um, you know, gamified test or assessment test. There may be useful ones that, that can highlight valuable things, but none of them are going to perfectly objectively capture um, people's true skills. Brilliant. Um, okay, so let's now turn to Ella, uh, if she's there. She, she will present uh, five slides that summarise this whole thing. Hi. Hi. I think Tom is just teeing up the slides. Here we go. Um, so I think that Patrick mentioned some of the um, different ways and different stages of the process and, and the tech that is used at each stage. But just to run through it again, you can see here that recruitment tech is really getting much more sophisticated. Um, and there are at every single stage of the process, there are platforms recruiters can use to automatically narrow down candidate lists. So um, LinkedIn and ZipRecruiter offer automatic candidate matching services to help companies with their talent services. Another really major piece of recruitment tech um, at the screening stage is a thing called an ATS or an applicant tracking system. And these are programs that manage CVs and applicant data and they often have um, keyword matching capabilities um, and algorithms that read and rank CVs. Um, and down the bottom, we've got some of that video interview software that Alexi mentioned. Um, um, brilliant. And uh, lots of large companies are using digital hiring systems because of the volume of the applications that they receive for each role. And it seems like COVID is going to accelerate that process. Um, you can see that 86% of organisations are using new tech to interview candidates. Um, and across the board, a lot of companies are planning on spending more on recruitment tech in the future. Um, as we said, digital recruitment tech is really useful for a lot of companies. Um, hiring can be really time consuming and costly and getting the wrong candidate can mean low retention rates and other expensive hiring rounds. Modeling by McKinsey showed here that um, digital hiring platforms would lead to gains in um, productivity and profit and cost reductions for a range of um, large companies across different industries. 
but there are concerns as we've talked about that hiring algorithms will reproduce real world racial and gender discrimination, um, especially as machine learning tech is trained on that historical um, hiring data. Um, so this slide shows um, some recent research by MIT in Columbia, which showed that the design of an algorithm really matters. So they trained three types of algorithms on hiring data from a Fortune 500 company and compared the candidates that were surfaced um, as compared to a human recruiter. And uh, they're typically um, hiring al algorithms are based on a supervised learning model, um, which is trained on historical hiring data. Um, and they tended to perform worse, a lot worse, um, than a human on selecting black and Hispanic candidates. However, a type of algorithm called an upper confidence bound algorithm performed much better than a human. Um, and this algorithm has an exploration bonus built in where there is an implicit reward in surfacing high quality candidates with different characteristics to a historical hire. Um, in terms of female applicants, all of them did better than the human. Um, so in conclusion, there are a range of pros and cons to using algorithms for recruitment. They can save time and money, but we do have to be wary, as Jazz said, about reproducing um, bias. And um, we th have to think carefully about how we design this tech. Thank you very much. That's, that's brilliant, Ella. Thank you. Um, so I, I'm so pleased because that everyone's kind of come into the chat and, and voice their views in a really, really interesting way. So let's pause now for a bit and, and go to people within the chat because there are some brilliant points being made, most of them uh, on the negative slant. So if anyone uh, has, has a positive experience of, of AI and recruitment, then put yourself in the chat and then I'll, I'll come to you. But can I turn to Catherine Simmons now, please? So Catherine is a senior IT manager in the charity social business sector. And I think that she's going to make a point that maybe it's not actually the tech that's the key problem in terms of getting the right people to the right job. T tell, tell us about your experiences when you were approached uh, by a recruiter at a seminar. Okay, um, thanks. And I really should learn to uh, make sure that I haven't just washed my hair when I come on these things. Um, yeah, so I... I spoke with a recruiter who I've worked with as a as a hiring manager as well as as a um, as I'm I'm now looking for work myself, having rather badly timed leaving my job back in February. Um, and he said that he was telling me about uh, the KPMG report that's uh, most I think most uh, recruitment agencies subscribe to which is kind of state of the industry thing and as recent and this was in september so not very long ago um he was telling me that even at my level which is you know is reasonably senior um there were about a thousand applications for every role um and that if you were applying for a job on a job board um they probably actually close off within a few hours um, and to me, that says that the problem isn't really um, one of uh, kind of selecting the right CV. It's, it's a problem of having far too many CVs applying for any given role. Now, to some extent, that's unemployment and the, the, the problem with COVID. But I think that the root of this, there is something about the, the, how dysfunctional the um, the job market is in that it's so difficult for the right person to find the right role and for the right for the right recruiter or um, recruiting company employer to find the right person. I know myself, I've, I've had roles where I've managed it directly and I've had three or 400 applicants, probably a quarter or a third of whom haven't even been eligible to work in the UK. Um, and of three or four hundred roles, I've, I've, having gone through them very meticulously, I've found maybe ten that I would have thought were worth interviewing. And I'm pretty good at, I mean, I, I have a bit of a, un, a bit of a conscious bias when hiring in tech towards uh, women and people of colour because I'm, well, I'm a woman and, you know, I kind of go for that kind of thing. Um, so, you know, I don't think it's just me being picky. Um, 
And I, I, so I think there's a, there's, that's really the problem. And I'm not sure that the AI is actually getting at that. I think that all the AI is doing in many ways is exacerbating it by biasing for people who are very quick off the mark, um, whose sort of way of um, job hunting is just to push CVs into, um, into these, these systems. And, um, you know, I, I, just, I feel the whole thing is, is really a very broken broken market at the moment. Yeah, yeah. Catherine, you, me, um, you, you, you say in your comments that you, you think the only sensible way to job hunt right now is by networking and hoping to hit someone's affinity bias. Do, do you think in this climate when you do get thousands of applicants per interview that that is actually quite a good argument for technology coming in to try and try and filter some of them out in unbiased ways because if the if the push is towards a, a, an affinity bias situation where that's the only way you can get a job, doesn't that increase the the, the space that technology needs to kind of come in and fill? Of course it does, um, but I don't think it, technology is doing it in um, a particularly good way at the moment. Or well, perhaps it is, and I'm just not. <laughs> I, you know, I'm just filtered out. Um, but. Um, you know, certainly the advice I'm getting from recruiters is fine, apply for the jobs, you know, we'll call you if we need you, if we can, if we see anything. But um, it's, it's about talking to the people you know and trying to find jobs before they're advertised, that kind of thing. Um, so from, a, from an employer point of view, um, you know, I want as wide a range of, of candidates as possible, but actually what I really want is the right person for the job with the minimum amount of effort. Um, and if the, if the algorithms are actually giving me that, then um, that's, that's great. Um, so if I get to a point where rather than having to read 300 CVs, I have to read 10 and, and you know, interview six and hire one. Um, is that actually happening? And what are the effectiveness measures on these, on these algorithms? And how well are the um, candidates lasting? Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. I mean, just reading some of the comments, it's, so, it's, it's, it's really interesting. Tom, who we spoke to earlier, who, who has worked in this industry, said that he conducted a controlled study and found that anonymized CVs and sourcing disadvantaged young women and that the Australian government uh, found found the same. Stephen R has said, this is all rubbish, really. Questionable use of technology for the sake of it. Um, th there is a question, uh, it, isn't there, about how we measure the effectiveness of AI uh, in, in the tech space. If, if you're talking, Michelle, if you're talking about making the case for AI, what are the kind of the key bullet points that you would make to, to convince someone that there are actually measurable advantages in employing AI in recruitment? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I, there are a number, and we actually work very closely with our clients around setting up those measures for success right at, at the get-go. So um, there's certainly from an experience perspective, feedback from candidates who are going through the process and the experience that they're having. And so we uh, measure that. Um, then there is efficiency, right? The process efficiency piece um, that was that was talked to earlier, and you know the goal of these sorts of technologies is to do exactly what was talked about in terms of you know giving you a short list of qualified applicants that you can easily you know, and quickly um, interview. I think the the challenge, the problem isn't always the technology. The problem is sometimes the process and the way that that technology is actually being implemented in the recruitment funnel. Um, and I've seen all sorts of things where recruiters, and not to disparage recruiters, because I was a recruiter for many, many years myself, you know, scanning CVs manually before the tech was introduced. So I have complete empathy. Um, but sometimes they use these technologies haphazardly, right? We use them for some candidates and not for others, and then bypassing and, and a whole lot of different things. So um, I think there's definitely that piece that we just need to keep in mind. Um, I think the other thing, just from a fairness perspective, we've seen significant gains for, for our clients around um, fairness in terms of the, for graduates, the number of 
schools that they're now hiring from in comparison to where they were um, previously. Um, you know, gender um, diversity, ethnic diversity, you know, etc. So all of those stats have, you know, have gone up. And I think that once again, it comes down to the technology you're using. And I just want to make a point um, here around the fairness perspective around the algorithms should actually be de-biased before they are deployed. Um, and not every AI vendor will do that. Uh, it's something that we do and our um, de-biasing tech called Audit AI is actually on GitHub. It's open source because we feel so passionately about supporting diversity in, in, um, in the world of work. And so you can effectively test um, whether your algorithm will be biased or not and, and manage that um, accordingly up front. So, yes, Sorry, I'm just really interested in that. Like you say, you can effectively test it, but no, is there any, is anyone measuring how effectively you test it that isn't your own company? Uh, and no. and that, that, and also, there's no regulatory framework that requires you to debias your your mm -hmm. technology. Is that also correct? Very, very two very good points. So, um, so first of all, there are a growing number of independent consultancies who are offering um, algorithm auditing. So we're going through um, that process right now ourselves. Um, Kathy O'Neill, who wrote the book um, Weapons of Math Destruction, uh, that's M-A-T-H, Destruction, not just a lisp I have. And um, she's written a fabulous book and has a consulting firm that she's established to actually do this work in terms of auditing the, the debiasing efforts of, of AI firms. And um, so we are going down that path ourselves because we feel so strongly about it. Um, my colleagues in the US are now working to um, institute legislation to ensure that all you know, AI um, firms actually go down that debiasing path as we've done. So you're right, it's really on the cusp now of, of really moving um, in, that, in that direction. I'd like to talk in a minute about transparency because I read somewhere um, that uh, an AI technology that's used used in this field analyzes four million data points on occasion to come to it, its decisions, and and I don't know how many people are aware of what those data points are or, or how they work, even within the companies that sell sell the software. Um, but can I can I come to Nia John, please? Is she is she around, Nia? Because uh, that you made a very good point in your hi you made a really good point in 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 the chat about how your manager had to fight for you to be employed uh because you hadn't been to university but you were still a suitable candidate and that you may not have had that opportunity had you been ai'd into uh, oblivion yeah absolutely so i got a new job during lockdown but i don't meet the minimum requirements for that job and um, mostly because i don't have a degree um and yeah in this case it wasn't something that had gone and been data scraped um it, it did end up in front of my now manager and he yeah he had to fight hr to say i really want to interview this person because while i didn't meet the requirements i clearly had all the skills and i had a lot of um uh, like a lot of experience in this industry and um, I sort of work in tech a little bit um, and you know now have the job and I'm very very happy and yeah I think with, if you have a sort of non-traditional um, like career path or if you don't necessarily hit all of these exact points because the problem is if you're writing an algorithm to say right does this person meet the requirements you need to have a very set idea of what those requirements are before you write that algorithm. Um, and yeah, I would worry that, especially if you're somebody who's maybe returning to the workforce, uh, or again, someone who hasn't been to university or has just come to this sector for a, you know, a non-traditional route, there's no way for you to do that if you're going to be thrown out um, straight away by an algorithm that says, yeah, you, you're not what I'm expecting. I I'm going to ask you a question that I want to ask all the panel as well, which is, um, you, would you have preferred to have tried to go into the job market um, 10 years ago versus now? Do you, do you think that perhaps aspects of either your character or your background would have uh, hindered you 10 years ago in a way that they don't now? Wh which would you have preferred to go down? 
Ooh. Um, I think because, so I think in my instance, actually, I probably would do better now because again, one, I got this job because of my experience, but a lot of my experience is doing like odd little short term contracts here and there. Um, so I think 10 years ago, I think people would have been like, well, why, why have you not stayed anywhere for, you know, over 12 months? Like what's wrong with you? Um, and I think that's just a change in the job market where, yeah, I think now it's a little bit more accepted to, you know, not stay anywhere for a particularly long time. So I think in my particular instance, I'm, I'm happy to be doing it now. Thank you. That's 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 fascinating. I, I want to come in a second to uh, my colleague uh, Luke, who has said that uh, AI is is effectively a band aid on a bullet wound uh, conversation. Uh, <laughs> but um, let's talk about transparency for for for, for a second. Jazz, you, what 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 strikes me as kind of scary is that these kind of commercial proprietary companies are developing technology based on a huge number of data points. And how many people are actually aware of how those data points operate? Um, governments certainly aren't, regulators certainly aren't, and probably lots of people within the company that's selling the technology itself certainly aren't. So the more that we bake in those data points into how we recruit people, the greater the danger. Do you, do you agree with that? Yeah. Transparency, it goes in all the ways, you know, I, I think that's why I'm it's so delightful listening to Michelle because having an understanding internally of what you are bringing into the market is so important. But many people, even if you have worked in tech for years, you treat it like this black box thing that this special department is just cooking up and it's going to be amazing and it's going to be great. And then you're, you know, you're in front of a potential client. You're not really understanding how it's impacting not only candidates, but the world at large, because, you know, if we use the example of Amazon's, Two, you know, two years ago, their experience of, uh, in, you know, including AI into their process, feeding it all of these male CVs and wondering why it didn't let women through. Um, that is an example that if it had gone right, that would then become the new golden standard that every other tech company wants. You know, they'll be, oh, yeah, we want to recruit like Amazon. Look at the savings they've made. Look at what, you know, what's going on. But I think it's so, so, so important to have an understanding of how the algorithm works. I don't purport to be an abs a mathematical person. So when I think of AI, I think lots of data. I think of algorithms as if this, then that. I think of it in terms of formulas and, and algebra, but I just think of it in the sense of, right, the way I do, because somebody has to have that conversation. It, it's, yeah, we, we can't have it be a black box. And I think going back to a point that was made earlier, um, oftentimes candidates, you know, I work with Hustle Career as a consultant, but I'm also a career success coach. They don't know when they're facing one of these systems. You know, so what, they, what, they don't sorry, know. Sorry, I interrupted. Go on. No, no, please. No, I was just saying that they, they don't know when they're facing one of these systems. Um, they don't know until it's, they get the automated rejection email or you know something else sort of happens or they just don't get anything back um and i think and i didn't even know the stat about you know those windows closes with closing within a matter of hours because automatically i thought who who can structure their job search so that within minutes of this job post going up that they can apply and again if we look at different parts of society you know if you've had to take a job, you've taken a role, um, you're helping somebody out, you know, you're doing what you can to make ends meet, for sure you're not going to be anywhere near your computer when that opportunity arises. And you're also not going to have the time to redo your entire CV to face the machine. So it, it paints a very bleak picture um, of what's happening. But again, it's a bleak picture because we don't know it. We, we don't know that's happening. And also, it's a bleak picture that has to be balanced against some of the very, very real uh, discriminatory factors that were in place before that the AI technology is trying to iron out. Yeah. Did, Patrick, can I, can I just come to you on the transparency point and, and on this black box point that, that Jazz mentioned? Do we need regulation to force companies to reveal 
how they are uh, filtering employees? Well, I mean, in a sense, we already have some regulation. The problem is that it's very confusing, ambiguous, and not enforced. Um, I mean, officially, under the GDPR regulations that came in a couple of years ago, there is a stipulation there that no, uh, no citizen should be subject to automated, entirely automated decisions um, that have significant effects on their lives without their consent. Um, now, the problem is that nobody's entirely sure how that applies to things um, like recruitment, particularly where you have a, a kind of complex mixture of the use of algorithms uh, and human managers at different stages of the process. Um, it's something that the Equalities and Human Rights Commission uh, in the UK have been looking at um, and that the um, uh, data protection uh, team have been looking at as well. Um, but, but clearly we do need clearer and more enforceable uh, regulation and, and not just about um, not being a black box in terms of being able to to be clear uh, how the algorithm is working, but even just simply whether algorithms are in use at all, because a lot of people applying for jobs don't know whether when they send off a CV, uh, you know, it, it's going to be subject to whether it's going to even be seen by human eyes. I think just kind of taking back to your point earlier about whether you prefer to be in the job market now or, or 10 years ago, I think one of the, the reasons people might prefer to be in the job market 10 years ago rather than now is just because there's something very unsatisfying about feeling that you've been rejected by a machine without ever having had the chance to even go before another human being. Um, and I think that that psychological element is quite important to a lot of people. So when it comes to these black box algorithms, um, you know, there's obviously important that they're understandable um, by the people that are actually applying and, and going to be subject to their decisions. Um, but then there's also the problem that you mentioned that a lot of the managers themselves uh, and even people in the company that makes them don't even necessarily know how well uh, or how exactly they work. And that itself can be a, a, a kind of smokescreen, if you like, that hides the fact that maybe some of the algorithms on the market, not necessarily more reputable ones, but certainly some of the ones in use um, <laughs> don't even work all that well. You know, there's a, there's a lot of what's called digital snake oil that being being branded around, and I think that a lot of the, um, the kind of facial recognition stuff and, and some of the other more kind of quirky outside the box uh, approaches to, to use of automation in, in tech really come into that category of things that when nobody really knows how they work, probably they don't actually work all that well. Um, but unfortunately, because it's so complicated and confusing and seen as this black box, it's not accountable. Nobody really understands it. No one can audit it. No one can explain it. And, and so people just assume that it's some kind of genius technical wizardry when actually it could be a load of rubbish. Uh, and that there are some examples of sort of similar use of algorithms and things like um, performance assessment. Uh, uh, Michelle mentioned that the Cathy O'Neill uh, book on weapons of math destruction. She has some great examples in there about uh, performance assessment algorithms that, that rate a teacher uh, six out of 100 one year and then rate the same teacher 96 out of 100 the next year with, with no reason for it whatsoever, just because the algorithm you know, is, is making almost random decisions. Um, but fundamentally, when it comes to, to, to the explainability, I think the most important thing is, is the unsatisfying nature of being on the receiving end of a decision. And when you're asked why that decision was made and you want some feedback, you can be told, all you can be told is, well, the computer said so, the algorithm said so. I think that is fundamentally very unsatisfying. That's very interesting. And, and, and actually, on a related point um, to transparency and regulation is the, is the issue of compliance. You mentioned GDPR. Uh, I guess in some of these situations, it's not entirely obvious how your data is, is being used by these programs. There, there's an expert that I was looking at in researching this topic that said we're about three lawsuits away from somebody taking this uh, very seriously. Um, I want to come kind of almost finally, I guess, because we've got five minutes to go, but we'll see, to, to Jennifer Allerton. Is Jennifer around? She may not. Hey. Hello. Do you, Hi. Do you mind if we, if we ask you? You made a really interesting point in the chat, which was that I think you're autistic, but that you you actually see potentially some benefits in in emotional recognition technology uh, that is employed by some of these um, uh, some uh, of these. Not so much in the emotional recognition technology. 
Um, I, so I think when it comes to AI and tech, um, like a lot of people have already said, it's about the humans who are designing it and the rules that you, um, you give to the AI. So what, how you build the algorithm um, and what you tell it to look for when it comes to things like data scraping um, and that sort of thing. It was in, in the discussion of now versus 10 years ago, um, I think I said that the kind of now there's better conversation and understanding surrounding mental health conditions. And I'm much more comfortable now talking about the impact that's had on my career to an employer than I would have been 10 years ago. Um, so that's the difference for me. Uh, yeah. When it comes to AI, I think it's all down to design and, um, like others have said, making sure there's an audit process built into that. Thank you very much. That's, that's really, really good. I, we've got about three minutes to go. So I might just summarize some of the things that we've, we've heard um, so that we can all get off uh, at nine o'clock. Um, it's been a really, really interesting discussion. Uh, I, I think what, what, what has come out most is that um, although this is, a, this is a story about technology, that this is also a story about humans. Uh, we seem to be both the problem and, and the solution. Human bias is what led to the problems that AI are trying to solve, but, but human bias injected into AI is, is now creating a new, a new problem. And it seems that at the moment we don't have the regulatory structures uh, in place to, to allow us to, to, to properly ensure that those systems are, are, are not being um, abused. I, I, I think that Jazz's point um, is one that resonates uh, really, really well in the sense that, that conversations, if you marry conversations with technology and make sure that the human side and the technology side are working in concert, then that is something that is a potential way through. But there are still some, some real challenges for people like uh, Michelle to, 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 to face. I mean, Tom's point that he, he scored 3% on, on a psychometric test is kind of a, a, an astonishing um, fact. Uh, and, um, and Catherine Simmons too, you know, you, she's faced with a job market where job applications close in, in half an hour. And what does that say about the tech uh, that is, is behind them? Mm -hmm. There's obviously a great deal of cynicism in, in the people in this discussion about, about AI and tech. Steve, Stephen R's comment that everything is rubbish really may uh, be a bit too, too black and white. But, um, you know, people like uh, Nia John uh, highlight very clearly that she got her job because of a human factor. And if, if everything had been automated, then maybe, maybe that wouldn't have been the case. But she also said that she would prefer to be in the job market now uh, than, than 10 years ago. So I, I think we can all, all leave this discussion, or certainly I will, with a sense of optimism that some of the inherent biases of the past are being dealt with, but they're being dealt with in the framework of a kind of private commercialized model uh, that doesn't have the regulatory framework uh, to ensure that everyone knows what's going on. Um, and that if you do get rejected uh, from a job, uh, you know why and by whom and by whether it was a robot uh, or not. But thank you, thank you all so much for coming and joining us at at, uh, at eight o'clock in the morning. I hope you have a wonderful day uh, today. Thank you to all our guests um, and see you soon.